All right, good morning, Bridge. All right, I'm coming to you from outside of my house in the backyard just because <laughs> uh, the office is closed due to COVID and all that kind of stuff. So we're just trying to do some different backgrounds. But uh, we just got done with Christmas, right? Just a couple of days ago. I mean, it's the 27th. And uh, a lot of us get kind of depressed when Christmas is over. But we're going to help you uh, keep Christmas going by looking at the life of Jesus and who he is and getting to know him better. And we're going to do a story this morning that really covers two little-known heroes by the name of Simeon and Anna. Both were prophet and prophetess in the temple. And we're going to look at what happened after Jesus was born. Um, he's circumcised eight days later. He's given the name Jesus. And then his parents take him to the temple. And that's where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 2. Now, this takes place before uh, the Magi come and all that kind of stuff. That actually happens later when Jesus is in a house. Uh, rather than in the stable and a lot of you guys know that historically so that has not happened yet at this point Joseph and Mary at the end of this are going to take Jesus back to Nazareth by way of Bethlehem again and that's when all that kind of stuff happens and then they have to flee to Egypt I don't know if you ever heard the story about the kid in Sunday school he was supposed to write something about Christmas and he thinks the Magi and all that came at the same time like most of us do in the Hallmark cards and all that so the uh, teacher in Sunday school just says, hey, uh, draw a picture about Christmas, anything you want. So this kid draws a picture of an airplane, and he turns it in, and it's got people in it. And the teacher looks at it, and she goes, well, I don't understand what this has to do with Christmas. And he says, oh, that's easy. That's Joseph and Mary's flight to Egypt. And he shows them the people in it. See, there's Joseph and Mary. There's the baby Jesus. And she goes, well, there's a fourth person in that. Who's that? And he goes, oh, that's Pontius the... <laughs> And you know what the answer is, the pilot. So um, we're not going to cover that part. That's going to be covered in Matthew later. But we go right into it uh, just a few days after Jesus is born. And it says that when the time of their purification came, this is Luke chapter 2, verse 22, from Dr. Luke, written to a Greek audience, by the way. It says, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Okay, so it talks about a time of their purification according to the law of Moses. Well, that's not Jesus' purification. We know Jesus, according to Philippians chapter two, did not have to grasp for a quality with God because he already was God. So he didn't need to be purified, but the parents, according to the law, after a child was born, had to go through a time of purification. And a lot of scholars try to explain why that was. It would last for like 40 days uh, for a male, and um, like a firstborn male like Jesus. And basically there are some that say maybe it was for health reasons you know they didn't want you to go into large public places you could go about your business and your daily uh, routine but you couldn't attend a religious festival when you couldn't go to the temple you had to wear a mask uh, I'm just kidding they didn't have that yet but they had that time and maybe it was for health reasons maybe it was because there needed to be time for immunities to be built up for the baby and all of that uh, they did not know about germs in that day, they didn't have antibiotics, and uh, God knew about those things, so maybe he just said, hey, it's better if you stay away from those places until a certain period of time has passed. Whatever the case, they are devout followers of the law, and these parents are very, very faithful, and God knew what he was doing when he chose them. They named him Jesus, just like the angel told them to. The name Jesus comes from the Hebrew Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. It means redeemer it means a rescuer the term Christ uh, that we know him by is the Greek form of the Messiah and then Messiah is the anointed one in Hebrew and so all those things tell us that Jesus was more than just a baby and the parents are going to learn that right now he is God in a body by these prophets and prophetess and what they are going to say about him so they go in for that time of purification, and they're supposed to give a sacrifice. Normally parents sacrificed a lamb for their firstborn child. In this case, Joseph and Mary are going to sacrifice two turtle doves or two pigeons. Those were the poor people's sacrifice. That was considered um, something you could do if you could not afford 
a lamb. And that's what Joseph and Mary give. And it's interesting that Jesus, we really see that he was brought up in a home where they struggled financially. If you wonder if God can relate to your struggles sometimes, he can. He grew up in a home. Jesus grew up in a home. Poor carpenter's son. Amazingly, a third of the world celebrates his birth at this time of year. So that's hard to explain if he's just a regular baby. But he knew what it was like to live in a place where they had to make ends meet and it was difficult. So they give this sacrifice. A firstborn male was consecrated to the Lord back then too, according to Jewish law. That was very different than neighbors around them that sacrificed their children to false gods and put them to death. Instead, God says, no, they're special. This is the first human life coming into your family. It's to be celebrated. It's to be set apart for me. That's what the word consecrate means. And so here's uh, God telling earthly parents to consecrate their son to him. Here's God giving his firstborn son later to us and that's going to be prophesied about a little bit in this next section. So it says, There was a man named Simeon in Jerusalem who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. So here's this great statement again about this guy, Simeon. I mean, he was kind of a Proverbs 3 kind of guy. You know that verse from Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Uh, we love that passage. Sharon wrote that on the back of our garage door at our house to remind us just daily to step by step trust in God and that was the kind of person Simeon probably was. And at just the right time, the Spirit led him into the temple to be with Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, just as God had promised him through a revelation that he would not die before he saw them. You're wondering what to do for the future. You wonder what your purpose is sometimes. You know what? You trust in the Lord daily. You follow him, and he'll direct your paths. You don't have to worry about the future. Just be faithful to him with what you do know, and he'll take care of what you don't know yet. And so this is what he says about Jesus and his identity. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And so here's something he says about Jesus and who specifically he would be and how he would be more than a baby. First of all, he says, uh, for my eyes have seen your salvation. There's that whole title again of salvation. Jesus is going to be savior of the world. He says, you've prepared that in the sight of all people. His ministry is going to be a public ministry. It's going to change people. He's going to be a light for the Gentiles. Now, that was pretty huge for Luke to say. Luke wrote the book of Luke, this account to the Gentiles, Matthew more to a Jewish audience. But that brought great hope to people like, oh, wow, he's for us. The, the Jewish Messiah is for us, yeah. And and what does a light do? Well, a light illuminates, it, it, it dispels darkness, it lights the way. Again, a symbol of pure purity from the one who is pure. And he says, and for glory to your people, Israel. So he's going to also be a king to his own people as well as others and the world. And then it says, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. I mean, if that was said about your son by prophets that you trusted, you would marvel too. I mean, to be a trusted prophet in biblical days, you had to bat a thousand. You could not get one prophecy wrong. Everything had to be correct and come true in real history or else you were considered a false teacher and cut off from the others who were considered reliable. But these people were people that they trusted. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, the child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. Well, what does that mean? Uh, falling and rising could mean, you know what, when people are confronted with the person of Jesus, they're either going to be lifted up, they're going to accept God's gift, or they're going to be uh, separated. They're going to be down. They're going to harden their heart. They're going to be indifferent. 
any of things, those things are a possibility when we're confronted with Jesus. And then he says, um, this is going to be a sign spoken against. They're going to be persecuted. There's going to be persecution about this because what do we do when light comes upon the darkness? Sometimes the darkness doesn't like it. And the people hide in the darkness. They don't want things revealed. So sometimes when you shed light on a situation, sometimes people shy away. And that's going to happen too. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. That part always made me sad when I read that. You know, Mary is the mother of the Messiah, and yet she's human too. So when she sees her son suffer and die for others who he came to save, I mean, that's going to break her heart. And just like Jesus is going to have his heart pierced on the cross and his hands and feet pierced, that's foretold 500 years before it happened in Psalm 22, she's going to have her soul pierced as well. Then it goes on with the prophetess Anna and a description of her it says the there was also a prophetess Anna the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher she was very old and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84 she never left the temple but worshiped night and day fasting and praying coming up to them at that very moment she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel now here's a cool thing I mean Anna was only married seven years and then she's a widow for the rest of her life she lives to be 84 years old here and she comes to console people to console others to console these parents and to console israel with the good news that messiah has come i mean she's one of those people where you know you can become either bitter or better right when you go through a trial at a difficult time she knew what trials were like she lived that out and yet she was kind and considerate and godly. Um, that reminds me of an Anna that I knew, a very young gal who in junior college when I went, uh, and I was 19 years old, a fairly new Christian, um, stood out in front of a classroom that I had. And uh, people were waiting for the class to start and nobody was talking to her. She was deformed. She was obviously uh, handicapped in a lot of different ways. Um, her face was kind of pushed in. She had had 23 orthopedic operations on her bones and her whole body and her face. And she looked kind of strange. She talked funny. Her teeth stuck way out. And people were just sort of ignoring her. I felt like God was leading me to go up to her. That was one of those, you know, trust in the Lord kind of moments. And so I just started talking with her and just started a conversation. And we became friends. She began to sit by me in class. In fact, at one point, she asked if she could go to Bible study with me. She knew I was a believer. And at one time, she had been. So I took her. And when I went to pick her up, she kind of acted like it was a big date. You know, she kind of said, oh, Rick, I'm really glad we're going out now. Um, cause, and I'm like going, <laughs> we need to have a talk, and a little bit. And uh, I wanted to be her friend, but I wasn't ready to do that. And then she said, the reason I'm so touched by this is she says, I'm 21 years old and no guy has ever taken me anywhere. And I thought back on that and I went, you know what? It was my privilege to even be used to minister to this gal. So we got to be friends. Uh, we talked more and more about Jesus and she ended up asking Jesus into her life. And then she, I saw her a few years ago, or I'm sorry, several years later, and she said that she was teaching kids who had special needs who had orthopedic operations, several of them like she had had, 23 by the age of 21, 23 operations, and uh, she was ministering to them. What better person uh, to help somebody than somebody who's been through what you've been through, right? I mean, if you're gonna go for comfort, you wanna talk to somebody who understands. And Anna was that person, and apparently this lady was like that too. And she encouraged them, and she gave thanks to God, and she spoke uh, about the child. I mean, here's this child bringing redemption and hope to Israel. Israel is this postage stamp sized little country surrounded by these huge countries that hate them. And if you look at a map, you can see it. And yet they still exist. I mean, they were brought back from the four corners of the earth, so to speak, in 1948. And God had planned to send a savior because he chose them for his own reasons to start and work through and send the Messiah. And she is proclaiming that news. And these parents are in so then it says, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew 
it became strong. That, mean he grew, that means he grew physically. He was filled with wisdom. He applied his knowledge to life, and the grace of God was with him. He was a child of balance. What do we learn from some of this and these parents and who Jesus is? We're going to learn more and more about who Jesus is, and that's going to help to, to know him better because like Simeon, like Anna, if you live that Proverbs 3 life, you trust the Lord with all your heart, you lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways you submit to him, he will direct your paths. Here's a question I want us to ponder this morning. Are you a follower of Jesus, or do you say you're a follower of Jesus while you really want him to follow you? I mean, I have certainly done that before in my life. I've said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be yours. And yet I have these plans. And would you please bless my plans and please follow me? <laughs> in essence, we do that. We're human. We do that. So how can we, over the next few days, as we get to know Jesus better and better, and as David continues to share in this series about how he is more than a baby, and the more we understand who he is, the closer we're going to be to him, how can we learn more and more to follow him instead of him? following us. Let's pray. Father God, I do pray that we would learn to follow you more closely, like these devout parents, like these devout prophet and prophetess who, who though they were old and, and though we don't know them very well, they're mentioned in scripture, God. You thought enough of them to mention just because of their faithfulness. They're not flashy. They're just people that lived one day at a time for you. God, help us to be faithful people like that and then to see you do great works through us as we wait on you for our leading and then fulfill our purpose as we listen to you more closely and get to know your son better for who he is. We pray for that to happen more and more in our lives as well in the coming days. We pray in Jesus' name.